This is The Words of West Cork, episode three. It's a podcast series where you'll hear something like this. There are people out there who know what's mm. Who know who murdered mm. that, that woman. And I can't believe that they can actually live with what's going on. I can't believe it. And we'll analyse using the words we hear, whether we're hearing truth or whether we're hearing lies. And we're looking at the events surrounding the unsolved murder of Sophie Toscan de Plantier. She was murdered in West Cork in Ireland in December of 1996. And we're going to look at the words of the people at the centre of the investigation. If you haven't listened to episode one and two yet, I suggest you go back and you start there. I share the way that I'm going to look at words, the principles I'll use when I'm looking at words. And also we look at the words of the prime suspect, a man called Ian Bailey, and one time chief witness Marie Farrell. If you don't know the story at all, I recommend the West Cork podcast or Netflix documentary Sophie Murder in West Cork and also a Sky crime documentary called Murder at the Cottage. In this podcast, we're going to look at the words and only the words that we hear. We don't look at facts. We don't look at theories. We don't look at body language. We only look at the words and we look at those words to see if we can get to the truth contained in them. What is really being said? What isn't being said? and which words we hear are lies, and where people are being truthful. You can see the words we look at for each episode online at wordsofwestcork.com, which is also where you can get in touch to comment on what you hear, to make suggestions or observations on the words that we look at. And across the series, we're looking at the words from the people close to the investigation. And today, the words come from some of the witnesses who all talk about that chief suspect, Ian Bailey. Now, there are many weird allegations about Ian Bailey. He appears to have been quite a character in his day. There's all sorts of stories about him behaving oddly, howling at the moon, and so on. I've researched a lot of interviews around Ian Bailey, and almost all of the stories told about him are secondhand. Or, you know, someone said, oh, people said he would do this, or I heard that he would howl at the moon. Those are no good to me because I want to hear people describe their experiences in their own words in order for me to analyse it. So I have found the words of people around him, including his partner at the time of the murder and his partner for the next 20 odd years. Now, when we're listening to the words and looking at the words of witnesses, I'm looking for two things. I'm looking to hear the description of what it is that they witnessed. And is it believable? Is it straightforward? Um, Is there anything added in there that we would expect to hear or is there anything missing? And also, I'm looking for any weakness in their language, any qualifiers that they use, anything that suggests that they're not really convinced by what they're saying either. But we're going to start with a story from a local called Billy Fuller. To set the story up, Billy said that he wanted to tell Ian Bailey what things, what allegations were being made about him. Have a listen to Billy's words. So I actually went up to, as a friend to tell him what people were saying about him, you know. I went around his house, innocently knocked on the door, he came to the door, let me in. He was sat down and he had like drink everywhere and like rich food and all this stuff. And he said, oh, do you want a glass of cider? I said, well, I'm actually working. I said, but I just popped in to see you. He was relaxed until I came out with what people are saying about him, that he'd be howling at the moon and stuff. Straight away, bang. He just went into a complete meltdown. Like, he was like, he moved from where he was and he went white knuckled and his face changed and he grabbed hold of the thing behind him like this. And he was astonished. Like, and he was like, you fucker. Like this to me. And I was like, what? He said, you saw her in spa the day before she was killed, and you saw her tight ass, and you wanted to give her one. He said that when he went up to her house about 2 o'clock in the morning, she ran away screaming because you scared her. He chased her to calm her down, and he stowed something in the back of her head and realised she went too far. And I went... Where did that even come from? It felt like he was saying what he did, but through me, you know? I was scared when I left his house. I'd just been sat with someone really fucking dangerous here, like, you know, and I felt scared. When he was telling you this story, did it feel like some form of confession? I definitely, yeah, definitely. I'd say by the by the way he did it to all the other people that he'd confessed to. Wow. There is a lot, a lot to unpack there. Let's go through his first paragraph again. And the words are, I went round his house, innocently knocked on the door. He came to the door, let me in. He was sat down. He had like drink everywhere and like rich food and all this stuff. And he said, oh, do you want a glass of cider? And I said, I'm actually working. I said, but I just popped in to see you. He was relaxed until I came out with what people were saying about him, that he'd been howling at the moon and stuff. 
Okay. How do you innocently knock on a door? Surely any knocking on a door is innocent unless, uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't know, but why he feels the need to say he innocently knocked on the door. I think he knew he was going there to do something uh, not guilty, but um, something that maybe wouldn't be appreciated, which is why they need to, why he feels the need to tell us he's a good guy. He was innocently knocking on the door. And then there's some disjointed storytelling here. So he says, he came to the door, let me in. He was sat down. So I'm presuming he stood up to come to the door to answer it and let him in. But then all of a sudden he was sat down, which is just doesn't add up. There's, there's something missing there or something false and constructed there. He then goes on to paint this picture about what was going on around Ian Bailey. Actually, maybe sort of to say he is a bit of a weirdo if you look at it. He had like drink everywhere and like rich food and all this stuff. Why does he feel the need to tell us that? Why does he feel the need to paint this picture? It could be that he wants us to think of Ian Bailey as a bit of a weirdo. It could also be that what's coming next, and you've heard it, it would be stressful for him to say, so he's talking about all this detail that is irrelevant to the story because it's easy to talk about because talking about what was there or what he could see is much easier than talking about the allegation that, that comes later. And the same for the next thing. Ian Bailey said, do you want a glass of cider? And I said, I'm working. I just popped in to see you. And... Um, again, that's not needed uh, very much, I think, part of this delaying getting to the stressful thing. I point out a lot of times, if you hear the word just, it's an indicator some deception could be going on. And here is a great example of it. He said, I just popped in to see you. Well, you didn't just pop in to see him. You popped in to tell him all the allegations that people around town were making about him, in, in your words. And then he says he was relaxed until I came out with what people were saying about him, that he'd be howling at the moon and stuff. And we have this vagueness again. The only allegation that Billy can verbalise is that Ian, some people say that Ian Bailey has been seen howling at the moon. He then adds, and stuff. Well, what does that mean? What is the stuff? Why are you not saying it out loud? It's weak. It's not really believable. Next thing, straight away, bang. He just went into a complete meltdown look. There's like, he moved from where he was and he went white knuckled and his face changed and he grabbed hold of the thing behind him like this and he was astonished. So this starts quite dramatically, straight away, bang. He just went into complete meltdown. There's that word just again. And why do I think that word just is there? Because his description of meltdown, well, it's not a bang, it's not a meltdown. The biggest thing he can think of to say about it, the first thing he mentions about this meltdown is he moved from where he was. That's not a meltdown. That's just moving. So there's nothing here to say exactly what this meltdown was, that he went into a complete meltdown. He just moved from where he was and he went white knuckled. That's a very strange thing. You have to be holding on to something to go white knuckled, but he doesn't mention grabbing hold of anything until a couple of items later. He went white knuckled and his face changed. Again, this is not an indication of a meltdown. It's just an indication of of movement, really. That's that's all it is. And he was astonished. It's weird. Straight away, bang. He went into a complete meltdown. And then the description is he moved, he went white knuckled, his face changed. There's no drama in this meltdown. Now, I wouldn't like dramatic words, but I would like to hear that a better, more vivid description of a meltdown rather than he moved and his face changed. And the next thing Billy says is, and he was like, you fuck her like this to me. And I was like, what? He said, you saw her in the spa the day before she was killed and you saw her tight arse and you wanted to give her one. He said that you went to her house about two o'clock in the morning. She ran away screaming because you scared her. You chased her to calm her down, threw something at her head and realised you went too far. Now, this is really interesting because you compare the words there to everything else we've heard from Billy, both sides of this, and this is very direct this is missing entirely. The williness, the over-explaining, the picture painting, it's very, very different from all the words. There's, there's no just, for example. It's direct, it's straightforward, and it's so different. It's going to be claimed that 
Ian Bailey was making a confession through this, that he was projecting his confession onto Billy. Was he? Did Ian Bailey say that to Billy? I don't know, but it's a hell of a story to make up. And it's if it is made up, it's made up really well compared to that wooliness that's around this from Billy's words. It's very interesting that this one description of this confession or so-called confession that Ian Bailey made is... Oh, it's very different in style. It's very different in word choice from Billy's other words. And then we hear again from Billy. And I went, where did that even come from? It felt like he was saying what he did, but through me, you know? I was scared when I left his house. I was just sat with someone really fucking dangerous here. Like, like you know, and I felt scared. And we're back into Willy. Um, I felt like he was saying, not I felt he was saying, which would be more direct. It's I felt like he was saying, I was just sat with, you know, I felt scared, not I was petrified or I was really scared. It's I felt scared. So there's a lot more williness again here in, in Billy's language. Again, Billy doesn't say what he was scared of of and you think um, if you've just been accused Ian Bailey in Billy's story at least has accused Billy of murdering someone now that must be quite scary within itself that um, if Ian Bailey says this to anyone else is Billy in a lot of trouble is he going to find himself dealing with the police he doesn't say he's scared of that he also doesn't say he was scared of Ian Bailey in a physical sense he doesn't say what he was scared of Billy only says he was scared I find that Quite interesting in Billy's words there. And also there's there's something missing here. You remember back to when Billy described going into the house, he took us step by step through what went on, that he innocently knocked on the door and Ian Bailey let it let him in, and then Ian Bailey was sitting down. Billy doesn't describe leaving the house. There's nothing here. So in Billy's telling of this story, Ian Bailey has accused him of murder. Billy feels like Ian Bailey is confessing to murder and there is no description from Billy at all about any conversation that followed that up. And I want to know why that is not there. I want to know why there is nothing about Billy leaving the house. I wonder, and I, this is only a wonder, if this is all constructed in some way and that the end of the story that Billy's constructed is Ian Bailey saying this in quotes, confession, and then uh, he left the house. And so when he's constructed the story, he's thought about the detail as he's walked into the house, how he knocked the door innocently, how Ian Bailey was, what was all around him. And then the thing he's really concentrated on is this um, confession or, or projected confession that Ian Bailey made. And he then hasn't thought, oh, wait a minute, realistically, when this has happened, we would have had a, a conversation about it afterwards and I would have left and I, I need as much detail about leaving as I did about coming in. I wonder if Billy's just focused on getting the story to the point where this comes out. That could have happened, but I really, I'm really interested in why that middle bit with the projected confession, why the language in it is so different from everything else. Another thing that plays into that is there's no denial from Billy about how stupid this must be for Ian Bailey to say that or what a ridiculous thing it is to say that about Billy. I'm not saying Billy's the murderer for a second, but I'm saying that we are not hearing that coming from Billy. There's just, if someone accuses you of murder, there's pushback and he doesn't discuss what that pushback is at all. Why not? Billy's then asked, when he was telling you the story, did it feel like some form of confession? And Billy says, oh, definitely, yeah, definitely. And then he says, I'd say by the way he did it to all the other people that he confessed to. Not definitely because it was believable or definitely because there was a lot of detail there that only the murderer would know or anything like that. He says it feels like a confession because Ian has also apparently confessed to other people. That's not a straight answer. He brings other people in here to bolster his story. So that's Billy Fuller. All I can say from these words is something happened. There's something in there that I think, especially around that projected confession, there's a nub of truth in there. But it did not happen anyway like how Billy Fuller is describing it in these words. So I actually went up to, as a friend to tell him what people were saying about him, you know. 
I went around his house, innocently knocked on the door, he came to the door, let me in. He was sat down and he had like drink everywhere and like rich food and all this stuff. And he said, oh, do you want a glass of cider? I said, well, I'm actually working. I said, but I just popped in to see you. He was relaxed until I came out with what people are saying about him, that he'd be howling at the moon and stuff. Straight away, bang. He just went into a complete meltdown. Look, and he was like, he, he moved from where he was and he went white knuckled and his face changed and he grabbed hold of the thing behind him like this. And he was astonished. Like, and he was like, you fucker. Like this to me. And I was like, what? He said, you saw her in spa the day before she was killed. And you saw her tight ass and you wanted to give her one. He said that when he went up to her house about two o'clock in the morning, she ran away screaming because you scared her. He chased her to calm her down. And he stole something in the back of her head and realized she went too far. And I went. Where did that even come from? It felt like he was saying what he did, but through me, you know? I was scared when I left his house. I'd just been sat with someone really fucking dangerous here, like, you know, and I felt scared. When he was telling you this story, did it feel like some form of confession? I definitely, yeah, definitely. I'd say by the, by the way he did it to all the other people that he'd confessed to. Now let's have a look at the words of some witnesses who had evidence to point to Ian Bailey being involved in the murder of Sophie Toscan de Plantier. The first one is Louise Kennedy. Um, my name is Louise Kennedy. I'm a, I live in Lissacaha. Um, I went for a walk on the 26th of December, St. Stephen's Day, and I saw a fire burning behind the studio. I just thought it was unusual. I thought maybe he was burning, you know, maybe getting rid of the evidence. I mean, I can't say that. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I, but that's what I thought. That's why I suppose I told the guards, maybe. The words there are, my name is Louise Kennedy. I'm a, I live in Lissacaha. I went for a walk on the 26th of December, St. Stephen's East Day, and I saw a fire burning behind the studio. I just thought it was unusual. I thought maybe he was burning, you know, maybe getting rid of the evidence. I mean, I can't say that I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I, but that's what I thought. That's why I suppose I told the guards, maybe. Uh, the guards, as we pointed out in episode two, by the way, are the Irish police. I don't like this. I don't like this. Um, there's a bit of picture painting at the start of it. Um, I went for a walk on the 26th of December, St. Stephen's Eve Day. Do we need to know all of that? Do we need to have the date and which day it was pointed out to make the story any more or less credible? Only if you're worried that the story isn't as credible as it can be, do you add detail in to make your story, well, you may feel it makes it more believable. Then Louise says, and I saw a fire burning behind the studio. How do you see a fire burning behind something? You may see smoke rising from behind a building, but you don't see the fire in that case, unless it's a huge fire, but I don't think it was in this case that she's alleging here. She says, I saw a fire burning behind the studio. Now, I get she could be looking on the back of the studio, in which case she'd just say, I saw a fire burning at the back of the studio. I think, I don't think you say, I see a fire burning behind something. And then there's that word, just. I just thought it was unusual. Well, this was the 26th of December. Ian Bailey wasn't a suspect in the crime at this time. She thought it was unusual. Yeah, I guess maybe a fire on Boxing Day is unusual. But then she says, I thought maybe he was burning, you know, maybe getting rid of the evidence. Is that really what you thought if he was not a suspect at that point? And then she goes on to justify why she told the police. I mean, I can't say that I'm... I'm not 100% sure, I, but that's what I thought. That's why I suppose I told the guards maybe. And she spends a lot of time justifying about why she, re she reported this to the police. Now, Ian Bailey became a suspect. If you saw a fire at Ian Bailey's place shortly after the murder, you do not have to justify going to tell the police that there was this fire. You don't have to, and you don't have to say that something weak and woolly like, that's why I suppose I told the guards, maybe. I suppose and maybe, is she being honest here about why it was she went and told the police? Is she being straight? And look at how much doubt there is in her words. I thought it was unusual, or I just thought it was unusual. I thought maybe he was burning. So she's doing a lot of doubting here. He was burning, you know, maybe getting rid of the evidence. I mean, I can't say that I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but that's what I thought. 
And I want to know what it is that she's not 100% sure of. Because obviously, if you see a fire, you don't know what's burning. You may know the object that's burning, but do you know that it is evidence in a murder inquiry? So why would you be 100% sure of that? She's even said it was maybe getting rid of the evidence. So what's she not 100% sure about? The fact that she saw a fire that day behind the studio? That's really possible. I'm, yeah, I'm not entirely sure about this story whatsoever. Um, I think that she spends too much time justifying why she told the police about it. The description's not very believable, and I'm not entirely convinced she's being honest about why she told the police about it either. It strikes me as not very convincing. Um, my name is Louise Kennedy. I'm a, I live in Lissacaha. Um, I went for a walk on the 26th of December, St. Stephen's Day, and I saw a fire burning behind the studio. I just thought it was unusual. I thought maybe he was burning, you know, maybe getting rid of the evidence. I mean, I can't say that. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I, but that's what I thought. That's why I suppose I told the guards, maybe. The next witness with evidence similar to this is from someone called Florence Newman. The Christmas swim is always, you know, a wonderful social occasion for the community. So I just went down to the swim when I saw Ian, a very striking person, a very tall, strong man. I shook hands with him and I noticed markings on his hand, kind of parallel lines, maybe four or five or six across the back of his hand. There was a uniformity to them, is what I would say. The time frame caused me to wonder, that's all. I just thought it was a curious thing, is what I would say. I told my family, and I just sort of wondered aloud, shall we say, that's all. The words there, the Christmas swim is always, you know, a wonderful social occasion for the community. So I just went down to the swim. When I saw Ian, a very striking person, a very tall, strong man, I shook hands with him and I noticed markings on his hand, kind of parallel lines, maybe four or five or six across the back of his hand. There was a uniformity to them is what I would say. The time frame caused me to wonder, that's all. I just thought it was a curious thing, is what I would say. I told my family and I just sort of wondered aloud, shall we say, that's all. Okay, um, not sure we need the description of Ian Bailey in almost admiring terms. I saw Ian, a very striking person, a very tall, strong man, almost like she's justifying noticing the guy. She then says, I shook hands with him and I noticed markings on his hand. Not there were markings on his hand. She needs to tell us that she noticed the markings on his hand. And markings is interesting. The, the allegation is that he had scratches on his hand and the scratches could have been caused from some sort of rough um, bush near where Sophie was murdered. But she doesn't say there were scratches on his hand. She says markings on his hand. If you see scratchings on the back of someone's hand, do you say markings or do you say scratches? And then she describes them. Not very well, though. They were kind of parallel lines. So not parallel lines, but kind of parallel lines. Maybe four or five or six across the back of his hand. There was a uniformity to them, is what I would say. Uh, so vagueness in there, uh, kind of parallel, maybe four or five or six, the, the number is vague and the uniformity to them. And what it felt like to me, she's describing there is almost ritualistic markings, deliberate markings made by a human, which is very different from, I would expect, the description of a frenzied attack in the randomness of nature scratching a hand. Um, now, ritualistic markings, they are first made up in the human mind and then they are made to happen. And is that what's happening here? She has made these markings, not scratches, she's made these markings up in her mind and now she's making them happen in that statement. And then she starts to justify badly why she went to the police again. The time frame caused me to wonder, that's all. I just thought it was a curious thing, is what I would say. Please don't think badly of me. I went to the police is what that feels like. I told my family and I just sort of wondered aloud, shall we say, that's all. I mean, how vague is that? It could just be I told my family. The rest of it is all vagueness. I just sort of wondered aloud, shall we say, that's all. She's not confident about what she's saying there at all. There is so many qualifiers in there. It's minimising her reasons 
for going to the police. Oh, I, I didn't really think it was much, um, but I, I just had to be safe because I'd wondered aloud. So she's minimising there her reasons for going to the police. You know, it's very much, I didn't think much of it at the time, but just to be safe, I, I went to the police. And again, if you feel you have evidence that relates to an unsolved murder case, why would you play down? Why would you have to justify why this made you suspicious? The Christmas swim is always, you know, a wonderful social occasion for the community. So I just went down to the swim when I saw Ian, a very striking person, a very tall, strong man. I shook hands with him and I noticed markings on his hand, kind of parallel lines, maybe four or five or six across the back of his hand. There was a uniformity to them, is what I would say. The time frame caused me to wonder, that's all. I just thought it was a curious thing, is what I would say. I told my family and I just sort of wondered aloud, shall we say, that's all. Do you want to hear what the police had to say about Ian Bailey? Well, here's the lead policeman on the case describing the first time he went to talk to Ian Bailey about some of the allegations. Ian Bailey is about six foot three. He was a very imposing man, full of confidence, and he was a very good speaker. We sat down. He made very good coffee, too, as a matter of fact. Oh, he would look, yeah, he was. He told the fucking country that I was after eating two men's spice food. I was fascinated, everything I heard about him. He was sizing me up, and I was sizing him up. Kind of a friendly conversation, but it was probing on both sides. Bailey, the complex character, you know, is a complex character. And I said, Ian, we better talk about his mother. I'll read you the words out because his accent is, is very thick. Ian Bailey is about six foot three. He was a very imposing man, full of confidence. And he was a very good speaker. We sat down. He made very good coffee too, as a matter of fact. Oh, I would look. Yeah, he was. He told the freaking country the day we left, eating two men's pies. I was fascinated everything I heard about him. He was sizing me up and I was sizing him up. Kind of a friendly conversation, but it was probing on both sides. Bailey's a complex character, you know. He's a complex character. And I said, Ian, we better talk about this murder. Now, I think this very much is someone who admires Ian Bailey immensely. Um, he certainly admires his stature, his confidence, his um, the way he's a good speaker, uh, the, even the way he makes coffee. He sounds a little bit in awe of Ian Bailey, especially for a policeman. That doesn't only come through in some of the explicit words he said about talking about how imposing he is and full of confidence and he made good coffee. Uh, he orders Ian Bailey first when he says he was sizing me up and I was sizing him up. He puts Ian Bailey first there. So this is someone who's a little bit in, in awe of, of Ian Bailey. And I wonder how many witnesses or potential suspects this policeman has been to in all his time as a policeman and how many meetings with people like that could he describe in such detail and with such vivid memories as he could with Ian Bailey. So definitely a policeman who in awe admires Ian Bailey, maybe even a bit obsessed with him. That doesn't mean he fitted him up, but it does mean that he had Ian Bailey very much in his thoughts. Ian Bailey is about six foot three. He was a very imposing man, full of confidence, and he was a very good speaker. We sat down. He made very good coffee too, as a matter of fact. Oh, he would look, yeah, he was. He told the fucking country that I was after eating two men's spice food. I was fascinated, everything I heard about him. He was sizing me up, and I was sizing him up. Kind of a friendly conversation, but it was probing on both sides. Bailey, the complex character, you know, is a complex character. And I said, Ian, we better talk about his mother. The witnesses we've heard so far remind me a lot of Marie Farrell from episode two. So they're very unconvincing descriptions of what they saw. There's, there's weaknesses in their words when they're describing what it is they have to say that they think is damaging to Ian Bailey. 
And also there's a lot of justification about why they felt they had to report this to the police. And remember, Marie says she did report what she saw to the police and then was coerced into making that story much more against Ian Bailey rather than some generic person who Marie could not identify. None of this means Ian Bailey is innocent, but time and time again, when I look at the words of his accusers, I just don't find it convincing as to what they say. Now, we've looked at some witnesses against Ian Bailey, people who think they have incriminating things to say about Ian Bailey. So let's look at the other side and let's move on to Jules Thomas. Jules was Ian Bailey's partner at the time of the murder and she continued to be his partner for the next 20 plus years. At the time of recording, they have split up. As far as I know, though, she sticks to the story that she's been telling all that time. If you watch Jules talk or listen to her on the podcast, to me, she seems calm and composed. She seems well put together and she's very thoughtful and measured when she's talking, which compared to a lot of people talking about this case and a lot of people talking about Ian Bailey, she seems much more considered and way less dramatic than many others. So I think it'll be interesting to see what we can get from Jules. At the time Ian Bailey was arrested, Jules was also arrested and here's her talking about that. Two guards came to the back door. They came and they sat down at the table. They said, you know why we're here, don't you? And I said, no, we're, we're going to arrest you for the murder of Sophie Toscana Plantia. Very hard to describe the sinking feeling inside. It was just disbelief and horror, absolutely horrified. And I thought, this isn't real, you know, you had to pinch yourself. It just felt so much like a, they were acting. There's some really interesting words in here from, from Jules. I'm going to start with the bit where she says, very hard to describe the sinking feeling inside. Then she says, it was just disbelief and horror, absolutely horrified. That sinking feeling she describes is one of resignation. Uh, it's usually a calm acceptance that bad things are happening or a bad thing has happened. That's that sinking feeling. It's not how you would describe a panicky feeling if something really bad had happened. You wouldn't use that sinking feeling. But she then says there, there was that sinking feeling. It was just disbelief and horror, absolutely horrified. And that shock, that disbelief, that horror doesn't fit with that sinking feeling, which is much more a calm acceptance inside. So I'm spotting some discrepancies in here about how she describes it. And also she doesn't take any ownership of this. She doesn't say that she felt those things. She doesn't use the words I or me in there. She, her exact words are very hard to describe the sinking feeling inside. It was just disbelief and horror, absolutely horrified. She doesn't say something more personal and straight and believable, like it is very hard for me to describe the sinking feeling I had inside or that was inside me. I felt disbelief and horror and I was absolutely horrified. She doesn't use anything, anything personal at all when she says, very hard to describe the sinking feeling inside. It was just disbelief and horror, absolutely horrified. Then she shows she can use I when attached to something else. She says, I thought this isn't real, which is much more personal, much more believable than that strange description that mixes the sinking feeling with disbelief and horror. And then she loses herself again and talks about you, not her. You know, you had to pinch yourself. Not I had to pinch myself, but you had to pinch yourself. So in that, I've got some indicators that Jules is making some of that up. Two guards came to the back door. They came and they sat down at the table. They said, you know why we're here, don't you? And I said, no, we're, we're going to arrest you for the murder of Sophie Toscana Plantia. Very hard to describe the sinking feeling inside. It was just disbelief and horror, absolutely horrified. And I thought, this isn't real, you know, you had to pinch yourself. It just felt so much like a, they were acting. Here's Jules talking about how she feels now. There are people out there who know what's, mm. who know murdered mm. that, that woman. And I can't believe that they can actually live with what's going on. I can't believe it. There are people out there who know what 
who know who murdered that that woman. And I can't believe that they can actually live with what's going on. I can't believe it. I will start with the first words. There are people out there who know who murdered that woman. Are there people out there who know who murdered that woman? Not just someone, because as far as we know, it was one person that murdered Sophie. But Joel says there are people out there who know all about the murder. And I guess there could be people, even if one person did the murder, someone told another person, that someone told another person, there would be people who know that. Why does Jules think that is what's happened? There's no evidence that I know of that that's what's happened. So why does she think that someone carried out the murder and they've told someone else about it? Or does she know that more than one person was involved in the murder? What is it that made her choose the word people to use? She also says they can actually live with what's going on. Now, I know they can be mean one person, but it does join up to the there are people part as well. She doesn't say who murdered Sophie or that poor woman. She says who murdered that woman. That sounds like Jules does not like Sophie, that woman. There's a distance in there, uh, potentially a disdain. I'd be much more comforted if she'd said who know who murdered Sophie or that poor woman or, or something like that. But she doesn't. She calls her that woman, which is what you say, you know, oh, that woman's here with her blimmin' dog again or that woman's come into the shop again and she's not going to buy anything and ask us lots of questions. It's that sort of way of talking about her. We've heard a bit from Jules now and I've seen enough indicators of deception in her words to be suspicious of what she's saying. If I spot one or two indicators of deception, I'll give that person the benefit of the doubt. We all misspeak, slip up, say things we didn't really mean to. But when we consistently see a pattern of deceptive language or things that could be leaking out, I go on high alert and treat everything this person says suspiciously. And that's why I'm going to ask you to listen to these words. Don't imagine they come from an innocent person. Imagine they come from someone with knowledge of the crime, someone with knowledge of the crime, and they are talking truthfully to you about the crime. Is it possible that the person who has knowledge of the crime, would they use words very similar to these ones? There are people out there who know what's mm. who know who murdered mm. that, that woman. And I can't believe that they can actually live with what's going on. I can't believe it. Jules has, has backed up Ian. Ian denies any part in the murder and Jules has been there in his corner of sorts for 20 plus years. And she's asked about, has she ever doubted Ian? Did it ever cross your mind that Ian could be the killer? No, I didn't doubt him. I think he would have been a mess if he'd been, if he'd done something like that. He wouldn't have been able to keep, keep it from me emotionally. I could see that something had strange had gone on. No, we were very close. I, 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 you know, I don't think that really his manner was any different to normal. If he'd known her, if he'd even met her, he would have told me. Yeah. He'd never met her. And I would never have allowed a murderer in the house with my three daughters. Insane. You know? I love them so much. Jules is asked, did it ever cross your mind that Ian could be the killer? And she says, no, I didn't doubt him. And I want you to remember that line. No, I didn't doubt him. Then she says, I think he would have been a mess if he'd been, if he'd done something like that. So she goes into why she never doubted Ian. And none of it is built on the fact of any evidence that he didn't do the murder. Like she was with him all the time or Ian is a gentle peaceful person that she's lived with for 20 years and never seen him hurt a fly. There's no way he could have carried out a brutal murder. No, her reasoning is all about how Ian acted after the murder. And even then, in reasoning terms, it's quite weak. It's, I think he would have been a mess if he'd done something like that. Not, 
I, it doesn't even cross my mind that he could do something like that. Only if he had done something like that, she thinks, but she doesn't know. She just thinks he would have been a mess. And then he wouldn't have been able to keep keep it from me emotionally. So just just emotionally, is she saying there that he could have kept the facts from her, but she would have found out emotionally? Well, that is what she is saying. She then says, I could see that something strange had gone on. On its own, that sentence is, well, could be fairly damning. I could see that something strange has gone on. The impression she wants us to get is that if Ian had been a murderer and was acting strangely, she would be able to see that strangeness. But on its own, that sentence, I could see that something strange had gone on, is is quite concerning, actually. You know, I think the words she wanted to use were, I would be able to see that something strange had gone on. But it's not what she says. I could see that something strange had gone on. She then says, we were very close past tense. This interview was recorded when she was still with Ian and there is definitely a bit of distance growing between them. They have now split up and that use of the past tense to refer to their closeness, we were very close, even though they were together at the time. A great indicator that there was some distance between them and should have been no shock to Ian when they split up. Jules also, in her words, she says, I think he would have been a mess if he'd been... And then she changes it to if he'd done something like that, because I guess that if he'd been the killer, if he'd been the murderer is what she was going to say. But she doesn't want to verbalise that. So she brings it down and she drops the severity of it and says, if he'd done something like that, just to play down what it is that she was talking about. Jules Nick says, I don't think that really his manner was any different to normal. If he had known her, If he'd even met her, he would have told me he'd never met her. Again, this is all in the thinking. I don't think that really his manner was any different to normal. It's it's again, it's not, his manner was no different from normal. It's, I don't think that really his manner was any different to normal. So it's quite a weak description of normal behaviour. And one thing that I've noticed a lot when people are guilty or have guilty knowledge of something is when they try and say nothing happened, they say it was all very normal. And then, very much like Ian Bailey in episode one, she goes on to this uh, thing about whether Ian knew Sophie or had met Sophie. She repeats one of his so-called alibis. If he'd have known her, if he'd even met her, he would have told me he'd never met her. The fact that he didn't know Sophie, the fact that he'd never met her, has no implications whatsoever on whether he is a murderer or not. The thing that makes you a murderer is if you kill someone, not if you've met them or if you'd known them. So this is, it's all quite weak from Jules. It's all quite weak. Did it ever cross your mind that Ian could be the killer? No, I didn't doubt him. I think he would have been a mess if he'd been, if he'd done something like that. He wouldn't have been able to keep keep it from me. Emotionally, I could see that something strange had gone on. No, we were very close. I, 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 you know, I don't think that really his manner was any different to normal. If he'd known her, if he'd even met her, he would have told me. Yeah. He'd never met her. And I would never have allowed a murderer in the house with my three daughters. Insane. You know? I love them so much. Here's Jules answering a similar question in a different interview. Was there ever any moment that you sort of think, maybe... Well, I think they say it, you, you've, you, you're sort of 12 hours, well, say 11 hours in, and they say it over and over again to you. You can almost brainwash people into believing things. So there was a, a moment of doubt. There was. But it, it didn't last very long, I can tell you. you no. Know? Was, there was no... Oh, goodness me, if somebody had murdered someone, I don't believe they'd be able to behave absolutely normally the following morning. morning. Do you? Do you think they could act that well? And he's useless at lying. I just know what he was doing that night. 
So Jules is asked here, is there ever any moment that you sort of think maybe, and she says, well, I think they say you, you, you've you sort of 12 hours, well, say 11 hours in, and this is her, talk, her talking about being questioned by the police, by the way, and they say over and over again to you, you can almost brainwash people into believing things. Then she says, so there was a moment of doubt. There was. Now there's doubt. In the previous words that we looked at, there was no doubt. So Jules has contradicted herself here. She did have doubt that it was Ian. It was in the police interview when she felt she was being brainwashed. But previously when asked, did you ever doubt Ian? She said, never doubted Ian. She then picks up on a familiar theme. The first reasons that she can give as to why she does not believe Ian is a murderer is his behaviour the morning after the murder. And because he behaved so normally, he couldn't possibly be a murderer. But she doesn't quite say that. She just goes, if somebody had murdered someone, so she doesn't mention Ian, it just goes on to normality. And also, she doesn't say that Ian was normal the next morning because she just talks about they'd be able to behave absolutely normally the following morning. So she's cre at least creating some distance here, or maybe she's talking more in concepts than what actually happened because she doesn't say, goodness me, if Ian had murdered Sophie, I don't believe he'd be able to behave absolutely normally the following morning. She only talks in terms of someone. And then she bats it back and goes, do you? Do you think they could act that well? And she's asking questions, which quite often is a deflection away from a sensitive subject. Then Jill says, he's useless at lying. So she's admitting that Ian has lied. And we all think some people are useless at lying. What that really means is we've caught them in some lies. We have no idea how many lies they may have slipped past us that we just didn't know about. And then she does come up with a little bit more justification other than Ian's actions the next day were quite normal. She says, I just know what he was doing that night. There's that word just again. And as we'll see in episode four, we're not convinced that she did know what Ian was doing that night. Was there ever any moment that you sort of think, maybe? Well, I think they say it, you, you've, you, you're sort of 12 hours, well, say 11 hours in, and they say it over and over again to you. You can almost brainwash people into believing things. So there was a, a moment of doubt. There was. But it, it didn't last very long, I can tell you, you know. Was it, there was no... Oh, goodness me, if somebody had murdered someone, I don't believe they'd be able to behave absolutely normally the following morning. Do you? Do you think they could act that well? And he's useless at lying. I just know what he was doing that night. So now we've looked at some words of some more witnesses and what conclusions can we draw? Well, Billy Fuller, the, the guy with the projected confession... I do think, as I've said, some of that happened, but he isn't telling the full story at all and he's embellishing. But logically, Billy Fuller is a bit of a puzzle. The other two witnesses we heard from, both of them spend a lot of time justifying why they did what they did and why they thought this may have been suspicious. So I can't commit to these people either. I'm, I'm not sure that they do have such damning evidence uh, about Ian Bailey whatsoever. Their descriptions of what it is they have seen Ian Bailey do in their words, they're not convincing, they don't hang together. They justify why they went to the police too much and, and play down the importance of what it is they have to say. And Jules. Now, Jules surprised me. In watching and listening to Jules, I, like I said, thought she came across as calm and measured and thoughtful. But when I analyse Jules's words, there is deception at every turn. She seems to be covering up something. And it's repeated deception and repeated leaking of things I don't think she really wants to say out loud. And it's hard to say whether she's covering up for Ian or whether she suspects Ian was involved, but she feels like Ian has convinced her that he's innocent, so she has to say things that she doesn't really believe in, or she has knowledge. She has knowledge and she's covering up for Ian or the pair of them. There is enough deception and enough things leaking out in her language to make me really wonder, what is it she knows? What is it she's not saying out loud? And I think that's the deception I spot in, in Josie's words. She's not 100% convinced about 
a lot of what she's saying because it is quite woolly, but she's covering up out of a loyalty to Ian rather than out of some deviousness. Now, this is all a bit of a roller coaster now. Are things becoming clearer? Well, in episode one, I looked at Ian Bailey. I did see some reassuring signs in his words, but I also saw quite a lot that worried me. Marie Farrell, the witness who claimed to have seen Ian and now says she didn't see Ian, we can discount her words. She's not credible. And these witnesses, I don't find them credible either. So that's a lot of the witness evidence against Ian Bailey I just don't find credible. It's not straightforward and it's not believable. But that does not mean Ian Bailey is innocent. It doesn't mean he's guilty either, but Jules... Jules is not straightforward either. She's defending Ian. She's on the other side of the fence and she also contradicts herself and her words suggest that she knows more than she's saying. From the witnesses, I, you know, it's possible the police got people to overstate what they saw or remembered. We heard the policemen who seemed to be in awe or have a bit of an obsession with Ian Bailey. But even then, were the police wanting to fit Ian Bailey up because they just needed someone to put in the frame for it or did they strongly suspect it was Ian? Uh, but didn't have enough evidence. Could there have been a local witch hunt going on? Ian Bailey certainly seemed to not be the most popular person in the community, had for some reason the community taken against him and concocted some stories around him or taken some legends around him and tried to make them stronger and word of mouth becomes fact. And before you know it, there's some witch hunt up to get Ian Bailey run out of town or at least towards the police station. And none of this means Ian Bailey is not a murderer, or Ian Bailey is a murderer. What do you think? Wordsofwestcork.com is where to go and comment on this episode, and we'll go through some of your comments, any questions you have, or any observations you have in the last episode of this podcast series. Neveratruerword.com is my website, and there you can see my books on how to decode words for truth and lies, just like we've been doing here. I also post regularly there on true crime and stories that are in the news and look at the words involved in them. That's never a truer word.com. I feel like I've left Ian Bailey hanging here. I feel like I've not drawn a conclusion on him. And there's a reason for that. Because in episode four, we're going back to Ian Bailey with some jewels in there as well. And we're going to look at Ian Bailey's words in light of everything that we've heard across the first three episodes. If you want to look at the words from Ian Bailey and Jules before you hear them in episode four, then go to wordsofwestcork.com. <laughs>